It's frustrating, you know. Um, it seems like they've had a prime suspect from, from day one, somebody who, uh, who had a motive, somebody who I know Tom was wary of. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. The case we're examining today is a unique one on a few levels. The murder of Assistant District Attorney Thomas Wales in October 2001 is perhaps the first and only assassination of a federal prosecutor in U.S. history. To some, it was an obvious act of retaliation against an attorney for doing his job and pursuing a prosecution. If that is correct, then so are the many officials over the last 20 years that have called it an attack on the American justice system itself. Attempts to uncover the truth have spanned from examining Tom's personal life, his public activism, and his prosecutions. It has involved bungled police work, the assistance of a serial killer, an elaborate undercover stink operation, a Mexican drug cartel, and maybe a hired hitman. Let's take a look. Tom was not just a lawyer. He was a father, an activist, an established public figure, considered a potential candidate for Seattle mayor, then maybe headed for the Senate or the governor's mansion. Harvard educated, he was a thorough and thoughtful prosecutor who handled things methodically and, some said as a result, a bit slowly. This consistent and rigorous approach to his work meant long work days and many evenings spent at his desk in his home office. On the night of the 11th of October 2001, Tom settled into his desk in his home in the Queen Anne neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. It was an office that he shared with his ex-wife Elizabeth, a literary agent with whom he had been married for 27 years and raised two children. Tom had kept the house, but the two remained close. Elizabeth wasn't around that night, nor were his now-grown children. All three were off on a trip to Germany, leaving Tom alone. At 10.24 p.m., Tom sent an email to his girlfriend, Marlis, as he often did on the nights that they spent apart. Fifteen minutes after hitting send on the email, Tom collapsed to the floor from the impact of two gunshots. Initial reports said that Tom managed to dial 911, but was unable to say anything coherent. These reports were later said to be inaccurate. It was unlikely that Tom would have had the capacity to manage a phone call after being hit with the shots. Mary Aylward, an elderly woman who lived next door, heard the gunshots and called 911. An off-duty police officer who happened to be nearby arrived within minutes. Tom appeared to be conscious, but he couldn't speak. Medics also arrived at the scene. After more than an hour, Tom was transported to the Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, where doctors would pronounce him dead at 1.17 a.m. He was 49 years old. Back at the house, Seattle Police Chief Gil Kurlikowski promptly proclaimed Tom's death and assassination. The shots had been fired from the backyard through a small picture window that Tom and Elizabeth had installed with renovations to the old house years earlier. Law enforcement has never publicly stated the number of shots that were fired. It has been reported between three to five. We know that two of these hit Tom. It was assumed that the shooter must have known the circumstances of the scene. The shooter seemed to have knowledge of the property and planned accordingly. The killer avoided multiple motion detectors, which would have activated the garden floodlights while coming through the backyard. They also appeared familiar with Tom's regular habit of spending time in the evenings working late at his desk next to the basement window. The shooter managed to slip through the dark and narrow cement walkway between the whale's house and the house next door, which was the only way in and out. One neighbor reported seeing a male figure exiting from the direction of the property towards a car moving swiftly just after 1040 when the shots were heard. The neighbor would not be able to provide a description of either the individual or the vehicle. However, investigators would reveal many years later that they believed the killer exited on a bicycle. The formal investigation got off to a very rocky start. There was a jurisdictional dispute between the Seattle Police Department and the FBI, which centered around the motivation behind Tom's murder. The logic went that if Tom was killed because of his job as a federal officer, then the FBI would take the lead on the case. However, if it seemed that his death was due to his personal life or other social considerations, such as his political activism, then the investigation would sit with Seattle PD. The FBI eventually took over, though all angles of the case and possible motives would still need to be explored. And there were additional issues. First off, the state's attorney's office recused themselves from overseeing the case since Tom was an 18-year veteran of the office and a close friend to most of those that worked there. 
This created an unusual dilemma, so the Justice Department wasn't immediately clear on the best way forward. They decided an attorney in Washington, D.C. with no experience in homicide investigations should be appointed as special prosecutor. The second major hindrance to investigative efforts straight out of the gate was the level of FBI resources. Tom was murdered on the 11th of October, only one month following the 9-11 terrorist attack that devastated the country. FBI headquarters set its top priority and some said its full attention to the terrorist threat. So the additional resources that would usually have been allocated to the potential assassination of a federal officer were not. The FBI gave the investigation the code name SEPROM, short for Seattle Prosecutor Murder, but the Bureau set the reward for tips leading to a prosecution in the case at $25,000, which, according to reporting from the New Yorker, was widely regarded in Seattle as an insultingly small amount. Unnamed officials involved in the efforts of this case would later tell the press that it was awkwardly handled. The FBI had few leads from the crime scene. Only the bullets and casings were left behind. No fingerprints, DNA, viable eyewitnesses, or a murder weapon. Tom was killed by a 380 caliber bullet that investigators quickly determined came from a Makarov semi-automatic handgun. These guns were widely available in the United States at the time. Ballistics experts noticed some unusual markings on the bullets indicating that they had been fired through a replacement gun barrel. The unique item with this barrel is that the barrel is silver. The gun's black. The FBI located the manufacturer of the replacement barrel and learned that approximately 2,600 of the barrels had been sold. The agency then undertook a search effort to track each one down. With so little physical evidence, the case relied on identifying individuals with the most likely reasons to want Tom dead. Issues in Tom's personal life were rapidly dismissed. He and his ex-wife Elizabeth had been sweethearts since meeting at boarding school at the age of 16, and they married on Tom's 21st birthday. The couple had divorced the year prior, a painful experience for Tom, but the two remained on very good terms. And Tom had moved on with his new girlfriend Marlis, a court reporter, and all accounts of their relationship from friends were positive. Tom's personal life was a dead end for motive, but his public life was another story. Tom was an outspoken, passionate activist on a number of issues, and he was both courageous and unapologetic when expressing his views. A few months before the gunman slipped into his backyard, Tom had been invited to give a commencement speech at a Seattle community college, and his words were powerful. Be engaged. Be involved in what goes on around you. Be present in your own life. Find something you believe in passionately and get into it. Get outraged. Take a stand. Then, Tom continued the speech by addressing a parade of controversial issues to a slightly stunned and largely conservative audience. He denounced the death penalty. He called mandatory minimum sentencing guidelines foolish and expressed disgust at the disproportionate number of black Americans in the prison system. He also expressed concern for global warming. Towards the end of his speech, Tom called on the graduates to go to battle. He said, go through that door and come battle me on these issues. Life is not a dress rehearsal, ladies and gentlemen. It's the main event. Don't waste your time on the stage. Amongst Tom's most zealously pursued issues was gun control. We lose the equivalent of two busloads of uh, kids to firearm violence uh, every week in this country. Tom spoke both openly and frequently against the National Rifle Association, which led to some ugly responses from some NRA supporters. Tom's anti-gun activism began in 1995 when a student from his son's high school brought a gun to school and injured two students. Outraged and spurred into action, the father mobilized and led a campaign for a ballot initiative that would have licensed handguns, mandated all pistols be sold with trigger locks, and held gun owners liable for crimes committed if their weapons were stored unsafely. In 1997, the initiative failed by a significant margin, but Tom was undeterred. He became the president of Washington Ceasefire, the gun control advocacy group, and he had firmly established himself as the most visible figure in the anti-gun movement in the state of Washington. After years of fervent campaigning, it was a cruel irony that Tom was killed by gun violence. This also led to speculation that he may have been killed by one of the many gun fanatics that he had angered over the years. Phone and online messages to Washington ceasefire after Tom's death did nothing to dismiss this theory. In a written message, one said, 
Somebody must have thought it was time to start shooting the bastards. Seems like a good start to me. Another said, Good riddance, and may his soul rot in whichever circle of hell is reserved for government scumbags. Opposing organizations threw themselves into the fold as well when a businessman and leader in the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms told the Seattle Weekly he suspected Tom Wales was killed by one of his own. Perhaps voluntarily, this man suggested, in order to elevate him to martyr status for the gun control cause. Others within Washington's ceasefire went into a form of hiding, abandoning the office and working from home. They feared for their own safety while agents began to work out if there was a connection between the group's activities and Tom's murder. At least the investigation had gotten back on track. The Washington attorney assigned as special counsel was replaced by Cornell University law professor Stephen Clymer, who was best known for his prosecution of the Los Angeles police that had beaten Rodney King. Friends and neighbors were sure it was a terrorist that had committed the murder, something to do with Tom's work as prosecutor. It seemed a logical conclusion since the attorney's office is charged with prosecuting terrorism cases and Tom's death occurred so soon after 9-11. But Tom didn't prosecute terrorists. His specialty was white-collar crime, particularly bank fraud such as employees embezzling from customer accounts. He did not really deal with violent criminals. Charles Mandigo, a former special agent on the case, said that they left no stone unturned. They tracked down his political controversies to rule out possibilities. They looked at ex-girlfriends, and they looked at every case that Tom had ever been involved in. At the same time, they were pursuing what appeared to be a potentially very logical suspect, a man Tom prosecuted in a case that was closed the year before. The FBI stated years later that they had honed in on this suspect only one month after the murder. The person of interest was a commercial pilot and gun enthusiast who was also partnered in a business that converted old military helicopters for civilian use. We won't use his name here, although it has been reported by some news outlets. He is apparently now a first chair pilot for a major airline. The pilot's business in 2001 was one of a number in the Seattle area, home of Boeing and its suppliers, that had launched a conversion business based on the surplus of helicopters that had entered the secondhand market in the years following the Vietnam War. A case against the pilot and his business was pursued by Tom Wales because, in the attorney's opinion and based on the evidence they had, some of these rebuilt helicopters were unsafe. There was quite a bit of money in this business. The reconfigured helicopter that the pilot's company was working on cost an estimated $600,000, but it would sell for up to $1.2 million. In the year 2000, Tom obtained an eight-count indictment against the business, alleging that the partners falsified records to get safety checks approved by the Federal Aviation Authority, amongst other things. But the case fell apart when the key witness, an FAA agent, reneged their testimony. The charges were dismissed. But for the pilot, the issue was not resolved. In July 2001, he filed a lawsuit against Tom personally, alleging that the case against him and his helicopter business was vexatious, frivolous, or in bad faith, and he demanded $128,000 to cover his legal fees and loss of reputation. When Tom's office looked into the lawsuit further, they found two witnesses that knew the man personally and called him violent and with a retributive nature. In addition, two weeks before his death, Tom appeared on a talk show speaking out against a proposal to begin arming pilots in the wake of 9-11. While not mentioning any names, Tom said he knew pilots who were not qualified to carry guns in the cockpit. This appearance is considered significant in potentially enraging the gun-loving pilot even further. The FBI searched the pilot's home in Beaux Village and removed 27 boxes of possible evidence. Agents also searched two houses in the nearby city of Bellingham, one where he used to live and one where he used to visit friends. In his former home, a bullet was removed from a wall for analysis, and a bullet and shell casing were taken from the friend's house. Two of his old neighbors said that they had sometimes seen him fire a handgun into the ground from his back deck. Investigators have been unable to establish that the pilot ever owned a Makarov, and found no connection between the bullets in the shell casing in Bellingham and the ballistic evidence in the Wales house. Over the years, the pilot has been forced to give a DNA sample, agents have searched his home more than once, his friends and family have made repeated appearances before a federal grand jury. None of this has turned up anything that the government could take to court. It's frustrating, you know. Um, it seems like they've had a prime suspect from, from day one somebody who, uh, who had a motive, somebody who I know Tom was wary of. And the man has an alibi. 
In the early evening, he and a friend had attended a showing of 2001 A Space Odyssey at a movie theater about 10 minutes from Tom's home in Queen Anne. After the movie, someone had made telephone calls from the pilot's home in Beau Arts, which is about 20 minutes from Queen Anne where Tom lived. If the pilot made these calls at 10.30, as he claims, it would have been impossible for him to have shot Tom at his home at 10.40 when the neighbors reported hearing gunfire. The FBI got a potential break in the case when a regular informant came to them with claims that he knew who shot Tom. Scott Lee Kimball was arrested for check fraud in Alaska in 2001. That name may seem familiar. Scott Kimball was not just a fraudster, it turns out he is also a serial killer. But before this was known, in 2002, he told authorities that his cellmate, Arnold Wesley Flowers, planned to order the murders of a federal judge and a prosecutor along with a witness in the case against him. The FBI worked with Kimball and an undercover agent to record Flowers organizing the hits with help from his girlfriend. In March of that year, the couple was charged with murder for hire, witness tampering, and attempting to murder federal officials. And Kimball did not stop with the Flowers case. Enjoying the special treatment he received as an informant, he kept going. Kimball told the FBI that another Alaska prisoner, Jeremiah Jones, had bragged about murdering Tom Wales by shooting through the window of his Seattle home in October 2001. Just as they had done with Flowers, the agents arranged a meeting between Kimball and Jones based on a false premise and intended to steer the conversation towards the murder. But, according to an agent on the case, when Kimball met with Jones, he didn't use any of the talking points the FBI had given him. The agent also said that Jones spoke as though he barely knew Kimball, much less that he'd confided in him about committing a high-profile murder. The FBI in Seattle wondered if Kimball had just made up the story, so the office brought him in for a lie detector test and asked him if Jones had really admitted to the murder. Kimball said yes, but the polygraph indicated that he was lying. Scott Lee Kimball offered his assistance as an informant relating to multiple cases across the United States in the early 2000s in exchange for payment and to avoid prosecution in his fraud cases. Almost none of the information that he provided turned out to be useful. When in 2006 he was caught committing more bank and insurance fraud, investigators linked his activities to multiple murders. He was convicted of four counts of homicide in 2009 and has been suspected in over 20 other murders, including, briefly, the murder of Tom Wales. Kimball's work with the FBI became a source of great embarrassment and led to a formal internal investigation of his handling in 2012. Agents involved were disciplined, and one resigned. Kimball is amused the FBI paid him for information. I keep referring to them as the most elite police force in the world because that's what they call themselves, and I, it kind of reminds me of uh, the Keystone Cops and the Three Stooges. Handling of informants was not the only thing that the FBI was bungling. In 2004, agents learned that only a few days before the murder, a neighbor of Tom's had reported a suspicious man lurking around the area. The report had been made in person at a local police precinct, so had gone unnoticed by the FBI for years. Five years on, the neighbor helped to produce a sketch. The man was described as white, in his late 30s to early 40s, 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 10 inches tall, with a slim build, black hair, tobacco-stained teeth, and a chipped left front tooth. He was seen in the neighborhood weeks before the murder carrying a black nylon suitcase. At the time, the sketch was not considered a significant lead because investigators remained focused on the pilot as their prime suspect, and the sketch did not resemble him. The approach being taken at the time was modeled after an undercover technique called Mr. Big. In a Mr. Big operation, the suspect, in this case the pilot, is lured into a fake criminal organization and then compelled to participate in illegal activity. The goal is to have the suspect confess to past crimes to gain the trust of the head of the organization. This didn't work with the pilot, and no murder confession was ever obtained. However, one source reported that he did agree to help dispose of a fake corpse that he believed the organization had killed, that is, until he figured out what was going on. All of this left the FBI no closer to solving Tom's case. Efforts to track down each of the replacement gun barrels for the Makarov pistol continued. In 2006, they had located approximately half of them and made a public request for assistance to track down an estimated 1,800 that were outstanding. 
Then, in late January of that year, a typed letter arrived at the FBI field office in Seattle regarding Thomas C. Wales. In the letter, the sender claims to have been hired over telephone by an anonymous woman who offered them an undisclosed amount of cash to shoot the guy. The letter explains how the sender committed the crime and then left undetected. The instructions were, hang out in this guy's backyard, she even gave me the address. Stop off at a place, pick up our gun, and drop it off at a specified location when you are done. Then you will be directed to where your money is. I used cash to pay for all of my expenses to avoid an audit trail. I drove to the address and then parked some distance away north of downtown. I kind of camped out in the backyard of this house and waited for the guy to settle in at his computer. Once he was there, I took careful aim. I shot two or possibly more times and watched him collapse. I absurdly waited a few minutes and then left. I was sure he was dead. The envelope identified the sender as Gidget and gave as a return address the address of a business in Las Vegas with no apparent connection to the crime. Investigators believe that the letter may have been typed at a Kinko's print shop or somewhere similar. No traces of DNA were found on the letter or on the envelope. The letter was analyzed by profilers at the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit and concluded that despite some factual inconsistencies and unrealistic claims, the writer was likely someone connected to the crime. The letter does not contain any details that had not already been released publicly, but it does fit a pattern observed in high-profile cases called post-offense manipulation of investigation communications, or POMIC. In these cases, the writer is often the criminal or someone who knows about the crime and is trying to throw investigators off the track. The writer could also be attempting to make false defense issues if the case ever went to trial. The FBI says the letter is improbable at face value because the killer says he was contacted casually by someone he didn't know, and this would cause a real hitman to suspect an undercover police operation. After five years, no arrests had been made. The FBI continued their efforts for years, never deeming the murder a cold case. By 2007, there were 10 agents assigned to the case, and the reward for information leading to an arrest had been increased from $25,000 to $50,000, and finally to $1 million. Uh, today is a day of sadness, resolve, and hope. It's sadness because today we mark almost 10 years at the loss of a good friend, a wonderful colleague, an even better father, and a tremendous member of our community, Tom Wales. We're here with resolve, though, because though it's been almost 10 years, there is an unflagging commitment to resolving this crime and to bring the people responsible accountable. They are closer to solving the mystery of who murdered a federal prosecutor more than 16 years ago. But they need the public's help. Assistant U.S. Attorney Tom Wales was shot and killed in his Washington state home in 2001. Officials believe there are people who know critical information that could help solve the case. They increased the reward money to more than one and a half million dollars. After so many years, a fleshed out theory of the crime started to emerge following the indictment of a 34 year old woman named Shauna Reed in Washington state in 2019. Shauna was on the FBI's radar due to her association to a small, close knit group of men, including one man, now believed to be a hitman hired to kill Tom Wales. Shauna had an on again, off again relationship with a man that had been questioned about the murder extensively on more than one occasion. In 2017, Shauna told investigators that an associate of her boyfriend had bragged to her about being involved in the murder of a judge or attorney that lives on top of a hill. The man she claimed to hear this from fit the description of the suspicious person reported as being in the neighborhood in the days before the murder. The obvious question is who the FBI believed hired the likely hitman. Their theory links the hired hit to the powerful Mexican drug cartel Sinaloa. You see, the, the problem with the pilot being the suspect has always been that he has a pretty firm alibi. Uh, there are phone calls that were placed to or from his home, 
at the time of the murder. And so while the FBI has been focused on this pilot who, who Tom Wales had prosecuted and they had gotten into some, some bad blood, they, the problem is that this, F, that this pilot has had this alibi. So the, the new information that was released this week by the FBI through leaks to the Seattle Times was that this pilot was somehow working for the, the a Mexican drug cartel and the pilot asked the cartel to get somebody to kill Tom Wales. According to state prosecutors, the cartel has a long history of trafficking drugs in western Washington. The theory goes that the pilot was smuggling drugs for the cartel and used this connection to put out a hit on Tom Wales. It is believed that the cartel then hired a man who owed money to a drug ring to commit the murder. It's possible that the man that actually fired the shots that killed Tom did so to clear a drug debt and had no knowledge of who exactly hired him, who Tom Wales was, or why he was wanted dead. The alleged hired hitman then enlisted another man, coined suspect number one in court documents to be his lookout. And suspect number one was the sometimes boyfriend of Shauna Reed. But when Shauna went before a grand jury in February 2018 to testify to what she knew, she denied everything and claimed to have never made those statements at all. This led to an indictment of obstruction of justice and for lying to the grand jury. Reed was interviewed by Seattle Police Detectives in August of 2017 and then appeared before the grand jury in February the following year. She was asked, in your first interview, did you say to the FBI that suspect number one bragged to you about suspect number one's involvement in the murder of a, quote, judge or attorney that lives on top of a hill, end quote. Reed answered no under oath. This was the first and only indictment linked to Tom's case. It came nearly 20 years after the murder. In 2021, Shauna accepted a deal and pled guilty to a misdemeanor obstruction charge. She was sentenced to time served, which was a total of nine days that she spent in custody and paid a $25 fine. For 20 agonizing years, investigators have worked the case with no arrests. They did identify a potential suspect, a pilot from Bellevue, but he has never been charged. Today, U.S. Attorney Nick Brown announced a new set of investigators have taken over the case. This means fresh eyes, local prosecutors looking at the evidence in this case anew and working on strategies with the existing team to bring justice to the Wales family and to our community. Tom Wales' murder investigation remains one of the largest in FBI history. There have been over 50,000 reports put into the case file. Efforts to individually track down each replacement gun barrel resulted in what agents called roughly 2,500 mini-investigations, but seemed to have uncovered very little. As of spring 2022, the reward for information leading to an arrest is 2.5 million US dollars. His children continue to hope for a breakthrough, and the case remains open and active. So that was the story of the murder of Tom Wales. Thank you again for joining me today. My name is Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.